Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I really appreciate uh, being asked to to give this talk. Um, the Hebrides is a is a place that's very close to my heart. It was it was one of the first sort of professional engagements that I had when I um, had left Birmingham to sort of find my fortune, and uh, I ended up on um, the Isle of Barra, uh, which was a real experience. It was just breathtaking. So I've got a real uh, sort of uh, love um, of the Hebrides and getting the opportunity to go out on the Silurian back in 2019 was just fantastic. Uh, I can highly recommend it to people. Um, not only the, the, the fact that you see some of the most beautiful um, uh, sites, I think in the world um, from, from the, the boat, uh, the experience of, of getting to see marine mammals um, at relatively close quarters, you're seeing fantastic um, survey work being done, really important survey work being done. You're in the hands of an incredible crew who just make really difficult things look really simple. And um, they really make nice food, great breakfasts, and, and just keep you very happy, which is great. So I, I'd recommend it. I'd highly recommend it. Um, I'll do it again myself, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, so check that out. Um, but I'll get on with my, my talk now. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. I think the volume's fine, isn't it, for me? Um, I am indeed um, the principal curator, one of the team that works with the mammal collections at the Natural History Museum in London. Um, I've worked there since 1992, uh, and I can't believe how fast the time has flown, to be honest with you, but I think that tends to be the case when you work for an incredible uh, employer, an incredible organisation, uh, with such amazing material. Um, there's just no question about it. It is incredible material. And I, I know I've been very privileged to work with it and continue to be. So um, hopefully this evening, I'll be able to share some of that um, sort of fascination and interest with you. Um, happy to have any questions about the, uh, about the collection. So um, I've titled the, the talk, 250 Years of Collecting, Citations at the Natural History Museum. Um, the Natural History Museum, as you um, may or may not be aware, is, um, is a fantastic um, piece of architecture. Let me just click across to the next slide. It's, it's a remarkable piece of architecture, the Waterhouse Building in South Kensington. Um, this is interesting for me because the, the British Museum natural history brackets, as we were, we opened our doors at South Kensington in 1881 and we were formerly part of the the British Museum at Bloomsbury, we were the natural history department. And our, the superintendent of that department, Richard Owen, became um, the first director of the Natural History Museum at South Kensington. But Richard Owen, the director, pushed really hard for the collections, the natural history collections, to be moved out of Bloomsbury because they were in such terrible conditions. They were in the basement. Um, they were being eaten by moths. They were going mouldy. All kinds of stuff was happening. And, and they were growing faster because of the, uh, you know, the scientific enlightenment. And, lots of collecting, lots of um, people traveling around the world. So natural history collections were growing really fast. Fortunately, um, the government of the day saw fit to provide the money to um, have the site at South Kensington developed. We moved across there, opened the doors in 1881. Um, there was a legal separation between the Natural History Museum at South Kensington from the British Museum in 1963. And then we formally renamed ourselves as the Natural History Museum back in 1992, weirdly the year that I joined. Um, we are a publicly funded national museum. We don't charge an admission fee. It's free at the point of entry. I love working in central London for such a, uh, a great institution that doesn't charge people an entrance fee. You know, it's free. You can come in with the family, obviously, once the kids get to the shops, it's a different story. But you know, you can spend hours just walking around the galleries and, and having an incredible experience. Um, and I think there's probably more than just a few people in the audience now, I would imagine, who've been down to the museum, who've had those experiences. And um, I had a really formative visit to the museum when I was 10 years old. I was on a school trip from Birmingham, as you can probably tell, that's where I'm from originally. And uh, I remember walking straight past the dinosaurs um, and straight into the whale hall and being blown away by the skeletons of these animals, these huge, huge animals that I was told by the attendants in the museum were still living in our oceans. And I found them absolutely fascinating and it kind of sparked my passion um, and really led me to, to, to do what I'm doing today. So um, yeah, 
museums, you've got to love them. They, I think they play a really important part in, in society, to be honest with you. So we are the, the um, UK's National Museum of Natural History. Um, we're a world centre for scientific excellence in taxonomy and biodiversity, and there are not too many of those, to be honest with you. The study of taxonomy is incredibly important. And our research collection uh, is around about 80 million specimens. Now, that always makes me smile, makes us all smile, because nobody's counted every single specimen. 80 million, that is a very good estimation based on uh, ledgers, registers, all kinds of documents, about 80 million. Now, the, the, this collection actually spans 4.6 billion years of Earth's history. So it's everything from fossils and, and uh, meteorites and fantastic things right through to uh, specimens that have been collected in the, in the present day. It's a globally significant collection. Um, it covers zoology, paleontology, botany, entomology, mineralogy, and of course the library and archives. We've got a fantastic natural history library, um, a wonderful collection of, um, of books, archives, including a, a world-class collection of natural history art as well, which um, surprised me. We have around about 300 science staff that um, work at the museum and they're actively involved in field work, collections-based research and, and curation of the collections. Uh, it's a lot of people and a lot going on. Now, um, I'll pop this slide in. I just wanted to um, show this um, to you. This is, this is Hope. This is our blue whale, Hope. Now, she was unveiled to the world in July 2017, but she'd already been on display. She'd been on display since the 1930s. Um, we took our lovely dinosaur, Dippy, out of the Central Hall, Hintzy Hall, back in 2017 and, re and replaced Dippy with, uh, with Hope the Blue Whale. And really, that was, that was, it was four years of my life working on this project, spending time in the field, um, observing the feeding habits of, um, of uh, blue whales in the Pacific off the, the uh, California coast. And it was just a fantastic experience. And I wanted to um, have Hope hanging in Hinsey Hall, showing her in that lunge feeding position, that posture, and it's fascinated people. It's absolutely fascinated people. But what, why did we choose a whale over a dinosaur? Um, we wanted to give people something that was still living. Um, we wanted to give, to give people something that was, that was a, really a, a symbol of how we, as a species, the human species, took another species, the blue whale, to the brink of extinction, right to the very edge of extinction. But we realized uh, just in time that we were about to lose it. And so we all got together and we, we said, hey, you know, let, let's stop. And in the 1960s, the hunting of, of blue whales was, uh, was stopped globally. And of course, that led to the moratorium on whaling uh, more generally um, through into the 1980s. And thankfully, that's still in place. Uh, and most countries observe that, which has, of course, as HWDT have um, attested to, has given certain whale species, which used to be more frequently sighted in British waters, the, the chance to kind of rebound and recover and start to come back in, in numbers. And it's, it's a cautious return, which is uh, something that has to be celebrated. But we wanted hope to be a symbol of what humans can achieve when they work together to, to, to protect the natural world. She's a fantastic specimen too. She, um, the, the story of her stranding is, is a very sad one. She, she beached on a sandbar just outside the entrance to Wexford Harbour on the southeast coast of Ireland, another beautiful part of the world, um, back in March 1891. And at the time, the Natural History Museum at South Kensington had only been open for 10 years. And the, the Cetacea Research Collection, the collection of whales, dolphins and porpoises, was comparatively small. And it was also cetology, the study of um, cetaceans, was, was a relatively new uh, discipline. And, the director of the time wanted to, to grow the collection and he, he felt that acquiring this blue whale skeleton for the research collection and potentially eventually for display would be a significant thing for us. And, and of course it was, but the lovely thing is that um, as part of the, the redisplay of Hope, I got to spend time in Ireland and I got to meet the, the relatives of the people who were there at the time uh, who um, were dealing with the stranding and who eventually helped to deflesh and prepare the skeleton and put it into crates and ship it over to, to London. So there's this real connection, this deep connection still with Wexford. We call it the Wexford whale. Um, and although she's lit up in blue uh, during the day uh, and, and into the evening to sort of 
highlight that blue whale -ness. Um, on St. Patrick's Day every year, we, we light her up in green just to uh, to remind people of where she where she first appeared um, and came into our possession. So it's a fantastic specimen, and hopefully, if you haven't already been to the museum to see Hope, uh, you'll make your way across. It's it's well worth it. So the the research that we do at the Natural History Museum, us three hundred or so science staff, there are there are ten research themes that are being developed actually at the moment. There's a been a huge refocusing of our research effort at the Natural History Museum in the past couple of years, and we're developing ten research themes that are intended to provide a strategic focus for the work that we do and help us to communicate how um, the museum's addressing the planetary emergency and all of these rapid changes that are taking place across the planet. And they, they fall into the, the, the broad categories that you can see on the screen. Um, discovery, origins and evolution, biodiversity, the Anthropocene and sustainability. Obviously, you know, a lot of uh, research institutions are refocusing their work to address the effects of the Anthropocene. So that's um, that's it. that's how we're um, how we're focusing our work at the museum. But digitization of collections is a, is a big part of the effort. You can imagine with eighty million specimens, digitization um, is going to be a big a big thing, and it has been a big thing. And we've been going now for for more than a decade. A focused attempt to digitize. Digitization, of course, means different things to different people, but effectively. It's about uh, getting the metadata, the, the, the data that's associated with individual specimens and whole collections, plus images of those specimens out onto our public platform to make the data accessible for research, to make it accessible to anyone who wants access to it for any purpose, pretty much. Um, but it's about making sure that our colleagues, our research colleagues around the world who can't afford to get to the UK, have, have difficulty uh, physically, financially getting to the UK, can access um, the, the material. And so we've been working really hard to, to digitize. Um, we, we output through what we call the, the, the Natural History Museum's data portal, where you can actually visit and you can search the material that's been digitized so far. And to date, uh, this is a screenshot from a few days ago, um, we're almost at five and a half million of the museum's 80 million specimens have been digitized, but actually that comprises um, 25.6 million records because you know there's, there's multiple data sets associated with an individual specimen so there's a huge wealth of data already there um, for example the lepidoptera collection the, the beautiful butterfly collection that we hold um, they started the digitization effort with the british butterfly collection and that was incredibly well received um, comparatively easy to digitize i would say i will be slaughtered by my colleagues in digitization because it is a big job and it's a job that takes a lot of care and attention. But you know, butterflies, beautiful though they are, they're quite two dimensional, they're pretty flat. When you start getting to the vertebrates and certainly when you start getting to the large vertebrates like the stuff that I work on, digitization becomes more and more difficult. Um, having said that, we have digitized big things. So um, I was talking about Hope, our blue whale on display in Hitsi Hall earlier on. When that skeleton was taken down from its original position in the museum's whale hall, where most anyone who's been to the museum will, will know that we have a, a life-size blue whale model, and then above it, the skeletons of five large whales. That's where Hope used to be. That's where she used to be displayed. As she was taken down to be prepared, to be cleaned, and then remounted to be put into the Hinsey Hall, I asked if it was possible to have every single bone in her skeleton um, 3D surface scan so we could create a digital model that was both suitable, serviceable for research purposes, but also could be used for education, for exhibitions, for a whole load of um, uh, engagement purposes. And, and they did. That's what we did. We, we actually digitized every single part of her skeleton. We make the data accessible to anybody who wants access to it for scientific purposes, for non-commercial purposes versus commercial purposes. You can actually um, access the specimen data through the museum's data portal and request a download. You can either request the entire data set, which is huge, or you can request something that's a little less um, uh, cumbersome. But what we've also done is we've created these 3D models that um, you can manipulate on screen, you can rotate them, you can zoom in, and, and we've put a few labels on Hope's skeleton just to give you a bit of information about her anatomy and some 
info about her life. So it is possible to do these bigger specimens, but it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of money. It also takes a heavy lifting crew with a whale. Of course, you can imagine to, to move the specimen around to allow you to get to all of the surfaces to do that work. But it's important that we, we do create these um, digital, what we call digital surrogate specimens of, of the largest um, uh, specimens within the museum's cetacea collection. There was a PhD student working with us a few years ago, and as part of her PhD, she was looking at um, the asymmetry which exists in uh, cetacean skulls. She did brilliant work and, and she got her PhD. She's now a postdoc over at um, the Smithsonian. And um, these are 10 models which we created from scanning specimens in our collection. So she could use the data for her research. And since these have been produced, there are research papers that have been published by external research teams around the world that have used these data um, for their analyses. So they're incredibly important, you know, to actually liberate this information and make it accessible online. Can't uh, emphasize that um, enough. So a, a little bit about the, the Cetacea collection in detail. Um, it's around about 3,300 registered specimens. So there's still a batch of material that's waiting to be uh, to be processed, but that's like every museum, there's always work to do. But the, the Cetacea collection is a, it's a global collection. It really is a global collection. There are specimens from all oceans, plus a significant collection of the uh, all of the um, species of uh, river dolphins, including one, only one specimen of the uh, Yangtze River dolphin, which of course we know was declared functionally extinct back in 2007. Very few research specimens available for that species in the, in the world, in fact. Our collection at the museum has more than 90% species representation, which is, which is pretty good. Um, so of the, of the 90 to 92 or so uh, species that we've recorded around the world, we have um, 81 represented in the museum's collection. Similarly, there are 78 type specimens in our research collection and type specimens, uh, for those who are not familiar with research collections, the, these are the specimens that are designated as the name bearer for a, a species that's being described, a new species. You have to have a specimen that actually represents the species that you're describing. So it, it serves as the reference for the characteristics of that group and then other specimens can be compared with it. So type specimens have a a scientific and often a historical significance. And you'll find those in our collection with a red label. So where everything else has got a white label, the types have a red label. Um, they'll also be the first thing that we grab in the event of a disaster. Apart from our coats, we go and get the type specimens. There's also um, in the research collection, this wonderful and significant time series. And of course, those of you that have worked with collections or those of you that work um, with any kind of data, time series uh, are incredibly important for constructing baselines um, for you to be able to look back and look forward and, and you know, incredibly valuable. Again, comparatively easier to create time series collections for things like insects, um, butterflies and so on with um, cetaceans slightly more difficult. Number one concern, of course, is ethical considerations. Um, but of course, one of the things that we do have in the UK um, and, and the, the, the component parts of the UK have the Strandings Network, which, which I'll talk about a little bit in a, in a moment. So the time series, some of the significant stuff that we have in our collection, we've got this remarkable collection of about 3000 teeth that came to us as a donation from the old Institute of Oceanographic Sciences in Cambridge. Um, and these 3,000 teeth actually represent 1,260 individual sperm whales. Uh, and all of these have biological metadata record cards with information about the, the individual animals. Now, they came from the mid 20th century, British Southern Hemisphere whaling activities, primarily out of South Georgia. Um, a difficult period in, in uh, human history, of course, because of the, the mass slaughter of cetaceans across the planet. Um, collections like these do exist in museums. We acknowledge the history and we welcome people coming to study those histories. And in fact, we're doing a lot of work with um, arts and, um, and humanities and, and uh, historians to look at the alternative histories that are attached to our scientific specimens. But that, that material that was collecting through whaling operations it has a significance now because I'm working on a, hopefully a project with a colleague, a team of colleagues to, to use those teeth 
to look at um, feeding, look at migration, look at genetic diversity, because there's such a wealth of material there. There's, the scientific potential is huge. We also have hundreds of specimens that uh, were collected from UK strandings from 1913 to the present day. And as I say, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But it does include that, that strandings uh, collection, includes 126 skeletons of false killer whales that were stranded along the Dornoch Firth on the east of Scotland uh, in October 1927. And we collected every single one. We collected every single specimen, which goodness knows how they did it. But um, well, I do know how they did it. They, I think they, they employed people from, from three villages locally to help them for weeks to get the material ready and into crates and on trains to be sent down to London. We also have um, some remarkable examples in the collection of Risso's dolphins. These are grey dolphins from the English Channel that were part of a mass stranding that was actually recorded on Jersey in the Channel Islands in 1585. And the Jersey Society has a record of that event. And two of those specimens were donated to the Natural History Museum in the 1930s, and then they're in re remarkable condition for the age. And then the, there's this remarkable, also remarkable specimen. It's a skeleton, a headless skeleton of a North Atlantic right whale that was discovered by archaeologists in 2010 as they were watching a jetty being built in front of the O2 Arena in, in Greenwich, for those of you that know that part of uh, London. Uh, that specimen is now with us. And again, I'll speak a little bit more about that in a second. So the, the collection is primarily, it's a global collection. It primarily dates from the early 19th century to the present day. Uh, we've got particular strengths in material from the Northeast Atlantic, from the Arctic, the South Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. Most of the material was acquired through scientific collecting, through whaling operations, the UK Strandings Programme and scientific exchanges and donations. The collection comprises things like complete skulls and postcranial skeletons. There are um, sub-collections of tympanic bones, uh, pelvic bones, teeth, baleen, and then there's what we call a wet collection, uh, a fluid preserved collection of things like fetuses, organs, tissue samples, preserved in 80% alcohol, not the kind that you can drink. I'd say, unfortunately, it's not the kind of thing that you can drink. Um, there's also a large collection of cetacean earplug samples. This is cetacean earwax which I am very enthusiastic about, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, but that's material that's been collected from 1910 through to the 1950s, which suddenly, six or seven years ago, just, just blew up in terms of the scientific significance of that uh, material. So just in graphic form, if you look at the, the, the families that are represented in the cetacea collection, we've got real strengths in the dolphin, it's the dolphin, the oceanic dolphins and the river dolphins. Um, and again, a lot of this is down to with the Northeast Atlantic, this is down to the material that's come from the Strandings Programme. Um, similarly, if you look at the number for the Balanoptrids, the 295, the second bar on the left of the screen, that's material largely that's come from, um, from whaling operations. And how are the collections used? Um, the research collections at the museum are primarily used for, for taxonomic and phylogenetic studies. So these are the, the sorts of morphological and morphometric evaluations that look at geographical variation in animals. They look at cetacean evolution. These are people taking you know, thousands and thousands of measurements, creating digital models. Also DNA analysis to study genetic diversity and things like population biology. Um, even though we're a museum, and, and, and oftentimes when you think of a museum, you think that the things in museums are, are precious, they are precious, but we actually have a destructive sampling program, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, but actually in, in natural history terms, sometimes you have to destroy to learn. So um, we set up a program for the mammal collection and for the whales and dolphins uh, in the research collection back in the early 90s to give researchers inside and outside the museum the opportunity to take samples half a gram of bone or a gram of bone or a single tooth or something like that that can be used for either DNA analysis or more and more stable isotope analysis now looking at things like um, diet um, distribution migration and so on all of these things are locked away in the tissues the hard tissues and the soft tissues of these specimens and, and we have them uh, we can we can build our own research questions or we can listen to the um, the research proposals from 
uh, teams around the world and we can say, yeah, we have a collection that will help you answer those questions. And ultimately, it's about liberating scientific information. It's about those research data being produced and then making them accessible to the public as quickly as possible, making them open and accessible. That's what it's all about. Um, with the earwax, I never thought I would do this, but you know, we were using the earwax to look at levels of stress hormones and chemical contaminants in whales. Um, it was a remarkably popular study, but I'm not going to spoil it. I'm going to save that till later. So we move on to the next slide. And um, now we can see the uh, collection in this huge underground storeroom that we have at the museum. And this is part of the collection. There's just no, even a wide angle lens can't fit all of this in. Um, I must also mention that there is another great research collection, another great research resource in the UK, and that's at National Museum Scotland in Edinburgh. Um, there's a fantastic collection there. So, you know, I consider it all to be part of the same thing, in all honesty. Um, but unfortunately, I'm only employed by the Natural History Museum in London. So this is why we're focusing, is focusing on this. But the research collection is it's the way it's organized with such large specimens with such big um, objects effectively. We have to have the skulls on one side of the room and then we have the, all the, the post crania on the other. And they're arranged uh, taxonomically. So it doesn't matter where you're from in the world. If, you, if you're familiar with the taxonomy of cetaceans, uh, you can navigate your way through this collection. And what you can see on the screen right now on the left hand side of the photograph, there's an upended um, skull of a, a, a sub-adult female sperm whale from, uh, from Durban, taken off Durban in South Africa. And then on the right-hand side, the specimens, the skulls that are lent against that, um, that A-frame, uh, we've got humpback whales, we've got say whales, we've got brutus whales. Right at the very end on the, on the right of the screen, you can see um, two or three huge skulls of um, northern bottlenose whales, male uh, northern bottlenose whales. And that's just a, fra a fraction of the collection. A uh, couple of the big ones. Um, on the left of this photograph, there's a very pale, um, again, sub-adult skull of a sperm whale, which came from a, a mass stranding on the Arctic coast of Norway back in the 1930s. And this was actually held outside a museum in Sweden, um, was acquired when the museum closed down by a private individual who donated it to our museum in 2007. Um, fantastic specimen to acquire because it filled um, a gap in the range of the sperm whale. We didn't have any specimens in the collection from that part of, um, of the Arctic, so it was useful to acquire this specimen. Next to it, uh, the larger specimen is actually from the North Sea coast. This was something that stranded in 1937 at Bridlington um, on the Yorkshire coast, and um, it pitched up in January that year, and the museum was contacted by the local authority and they said there's a huge sperm whale is the museum interested and we said i'm sorry but times are tough it's 1937 we can't afford to do anything um and that was one that uh, almost got away so it was actually acquired by a local businessman who um had all the over the oil extracted stripped off all the meat and then contacted the museum again and said look are you sure you don't want the bones of this thing um they're a bit mucky but uh, you can have it for 20 quid so we bought it for £20 in 1937, and it was brought to South Kensington. And you might not know this, because not a lot of people do, as Michael Cain would say, um, but there used to be these enormous pits, huge pits full, full of silver sand at South Kensington, um, where we used to bury whales to rot them down. Um, now, I know that uh, Andrew Kitchener and the crew up in Scotland, up in Edinburgh, do amazing things very quickly with large whales. And, washing powder and enzymes and all kinds of cool things like that. But back in the day in London, we used to bury these things. Now, re remember that where we are in London, the South Kensington, you have all of the embassies and you have a lot of very, very wealthy people. Uh, even then, you know, it was, it was the same. And they used to contact the museum and complain about the smell. Um, so there was a bit of a ding dong. Uh, the skull that you can see there, this enormous um, North Sea uh, sperm whale skull, it was the last specimen to be buried at the museum before the outbreak of the war. It came out of the pits in 39, and then a few months later, uh, the, the Second World War began. The, the, it was never restarted. I mean, I've always, I've been trying for years to get the museum to, to dig another whale pit somewhere, maybe up in Hyde Park, so we can drag some stuff over and drop it in. And 
I think it'd be a great spectacle for the public, but nobody's really gone for it. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's one of the largest sperm whale skulls in the collection. And then the other side of the, the storeroom that I mentioned, you can see the um, post craniate laid out, the vertebral sequences all laid out there. So if you're a researcher who comes to work in our collection and you're interested in the cervical, interested in the cervical region of the um, uh, of the spine, then you can access those bones, take them to your workstation, do whatever work that you need to do. It's a very well organized collection. Then there are hundreds, hundreds of cabinets of um, smaller cetacean skeletons. And on this uh, slide now, you can see one of the cabinets opened with some of the dolphin specimens in. Every specimen has a registration number. The registration number is its key. Uh, you can take that number to the registers, to the archives, and unlock all of the additional information about the specimen. So absolutely critical that those registration numbers stay with the specimen, as well as having a label attached to the specimen, the numbers are, are written on the specimen too in several places. So there's hopefully never a disassociation between the, uh, the number and the specimen itself. And then this remarkable looking thing, I use that word a lot. It's a word I always attach to this uh, collection. I use it almost every day, but this is a remarkable specimen. This is the the, the vertebral column, the spine of the whale that uh, was pulled out of the Thames foreshore back in 2010 in front of the O2 Arena at Greenwich. So we called it the Greenwich Whale. It was actually found at Bay Wharf in July that year. And um, it was incredible because the archaeologists who, it, it's the same in any historic um, uh, location. There's a, a need, if there's a construction job going on, for archaeologists to be in attendance to watch the work as it progresses in case you find a Roman villa or a mosaic, or in this case, a whale. They had no idea what was happening, what they were looking at, as these foundation piles were being driven down into the mud of the foreshore, huge bones started to appear. Um, about 100 years, um, 150 years ago, Greenwich was still um, in the tail end of being a, a significant uh, British whaling um, port, effectively. The ships coming back from the Arctic used to um, offload their cargo at Greenwich and at Deptford. And um, the foreshore was littered with the, the remains of, um, of bones of large whales. But this was something much more significant because it was found in a really unusual position. You have the river running um, east-west and um, the head of this animal wasn't facing the river. It, it was facing up the slope. This thing had actually been, sorry, other way around. This thing had been dragged up the slope of the foreshore by its tail. The head had been removed. We didn't find the skull. There are cut marks all over the um, surface of the, uh, the skeleton. One of the things that I did do was get some funding from uh, English Heritage with colleagues. And we did some carbon dating on the specimen. And it turns out it actually dates to between 1520 and 1630. It's a remarkably well-preserved specimen. Um, it's so well preserved, in fact, that uh, we're hopeful and we're very, very hopeful that we are going to be able to get stable isotopes and DNA from this. But it makes it the oldest dated research specimen of this species available for study anywhere in the world. And it was a real struggle to get this into the collection, uh, physically, logistically, uh, and also um, from a kind of a um, I won't say legal. Uh, we we have a, a right to to collect these things. We have a, a, an ability to collect these things as a, as a national museum. But of course, in London, we also have the brilliant Museum of London, which deals with archaeology, and this this kind of counted as archaeology. So I had to have a conversation with somebody from the Museum of London, someone from Crown Estates, about why this was significant to come into the museum's research collection. And it's funny because in the end, I actually ended up quoting this, which is. Um, it actually relates to the, the Fishes Royal Act, if anybody's familiar with this. This is the royal prerogative of 1324. And this effectively came out of the, um, when the Normans um, invaded England and, and brought their taste for salted porpoise meat with them. Um, cetacean meat became a very high status food within a, a few decades. And you start to see the um, these carcasses, the, the things that we now recognize as strandings and we deal with on, a, on a, a daily and weekly basis, they became the property of the, of the monarch. Um, different in England, different in Scotland, different in Wales, different um, uh, points of law. But effectively, we operate uh, at the Natural History Museum, our part of the strandings program um, under the Royal Prerogative of 1324, which I think is a, a fantastic bit of history, in all honesty. Um, 
And I mentioned that because back in 1913, that there was no national strandings network in place in the British Isles. There was nothing. Um, there was really limited interest in, in these animals beyond their commercial value with the larger whales. But the scientists in London at the Natural History Museum were desperate to get their hands on these carcasses, um, but were being prevented by the uh, Fishes Royal Act. So they, they petitioned the Crown, petitioned the government, and effectively the museum was given the right to have access to these carcasses for scientific investigation. So we established the, um, the Stranded Whale Programme, and that kicked off officially in 1913, and the first record actually came from County Cork in Ireland, as you can see. And uh, it's really the, the start of the story of how the Strandings Network developed around the UK um, into what it is today. Now, I've got a slide here that I think you'll be interested in because these photographs show you one of the um, false killer whales from the Dawn Up Firth from back in 1927. And these are large whales. I mean, they are significantly large animals. Um, there are 126 of them. And we collected, as I say, that the museum collected with the help of local people, collected every single specimen. Um, the skeletons, skulls and skeletons are in the research collection. There are soft tissue specimens from them preserved in our wet collections. And of course, there's all of the metadata. Now this, as far as I'm aware, uh, is the only collection of a, a single mass stranding that's been collected in total by a museum and brought into its research collection. So imagine the scientific potential. And in fact, I've already had two PhD students and three master's students working with this collection. So, and that's in recent years. Um, so it, it, has, it has tons and tons of potential. The um, Cetacean Strandings Investigation Programme, as it exists today, um, was basically it formed in 1990, um, funded by DEFRA in, in England, certainly. Um, the, the, the devolved governments of the, the nations of the UK have their own um, funding and they have their own um, networks. And of course, in Scotland, you've got the, you've got the very brilliant um, Scottish uh, Marine Strandings Network, which... which of course, is a key part of um, the, the UK effort because up in Scotland, you're lucky enough to see this great diversity, this greater diversity, I think, than anywhere in the UK of, um, of cetacean uh, species. So it's important, actually, because it, the coordination of the efforts that with the sightings data and the strandings data and the collection of those strandings data, um, the compilation of those into a single annual report that gets submitted to the various governments for, for consideration it, it allows us to keep an eye on what's going on. You know, are there issues with bycatch? Are there issues with um, um, uh, certain types of viruses? Are there issues with, you know, a change in the species uh, range of things, the warmer water species being found moving further north and the colder water species contracting, as we know is ha has been happening uh, over the past few decades. And, and you've seen that more and more around the Scottish coastline. So it's really important that um, these strandings data continue to be compiled and, and and assessed uh, effectively, scientifically. Um, it's the longest running strandings program of its kind anywhere in the world. And I think, I think the UK, all of the uh, partners should be really proud of that because it, it generates very, very good uh, information, very good quality scientific information. And it, it's a basis for so many people's um, uh, degrees, PhDs, postdocs, um, the data are there. And then of course, occasionally I have to go out and um, I don't, I'm not one of the people that goes out and collects the bodies and brings them into the labs to, for the pathologist to do the, the uh, post-mortem work. But occasionally there's a specimen there that um, I, I just absolutely have to, uh, have to be there and, and, and try and bring into the museum's research collection. This is one in particular, it's a pygmy sperm whale, just such beautiful animals. Um, and this came up on the south coast of Devon back in 2002. And um, I was able to head down there and uh, start the examination and start collecting samples for the research collection. The unfortunate thing that happened was the photograph on the left was as I arrived, you can see the, the tide was just starting to, to come up. And um, in order to kind of expedite the, the, the collection of um, material, the first thing I did was remove the head. 
because you can, you know, you can remove the head, you've got the skull, you've got the lower jaw, you've got a lot of tissue um, to work with. But as I'd just finished removing the head, the BBC arrived and they wanted an interview. Uh, and they wanted to do an interview for, I think it was the, uh, the Drive Time News, TV News. And um, they were really disappointed that I'd removed the head. And I said, well, what do you expect me to do? They said, well, is there any way, could you put the head back in position and maybe make it look a bit pretty, just so we can film it and people aren't gonna be offended when they're eating their dinner. I said, well, you know, my, my skills as a curator are quite limited in terms of um, being able to reconstruct and partially dissected bodies, but uh, let's have a go. So I put the head back into position and then I used a, a folded um, biological waste sack, a yellow waste sack, and just laid it gently over the, uh, the area that I'd um, made the incision. And we started the interview and I'm talking to this reporter about how unusual it is to see these animals and um, unfortunately and I don't know if this exists in the BBC archive somewhere as I'm being interviewed the head of the whale started to roll away down the slope and into the sea and I had to break off and run after it so I'm, I'm hoping that one of these days that actually pops up on one of those blooper shows at some point but you know you just can't you just can't let these things go um, and it's remarkable too you, you do get the opportunity to do things like on the photograph on the on the right is um, is me removing a particularly large and, and really quite um, unpleasant looking parasitic worm from the blubber um, just behind the scapula on the right hand side of this pygmy sperm whale. I've been told by my colleagues who work with parasitic worm collections at the Natural History Museum that I might find one of these things or more um, and could I keep an eye out. So um, so that's what I did. So. We get the opportunity to, to go into the field um, to, um, to collect this material. Really important to keep the material coming into the research collections where possible. But of course, we have to be very um, selective about what we collect because nobody has that much space. And of course, your research is so focused and targeted. You, you should only really be collecting to, to support the research that you're doing. Similarly, it's a costly process. Um, it's costly to physically bring this specimen to the museum. And then of course you have all of the preparation and um, the, the curation and then incorporation into the research collections. There's a, a cost to all of that. So that has to be considered. Uh, this is something slightly larger, which, which some of you may be, and I apologize for anyone who is eating their dinner now, I should have given a warning about this. It is a little bit gory, but you know, hey, there we go. Um, this is the whale that swam up the Thames in 2006 that we called the Thames whale, an absolutely beautiful northern bottlenose whale, a female, 5.85 metres long, um, not a particularly old animal in particularly good um, body condition, good health. Um, she found her way into the North Sea, she found her way into the Thames estuary and into the Thames, and despite the rescue attempts of, of very, very good uh, organisations, uh, she didn't survive. Uh, a lot was learned from that uh, episode. After the post-mortem examination had been uh, completed by our colleagues at the Zoological Society of London, um, I took a team down there from the museum to Gravesend to continue the dissection to collect material for our research collection. And um, this is how the animal looked in January of 2006. And then by May of 2006, this is how she looked. So this is the specimen in the research collection um, at the Natural History Museum. And, and you might think to yourself, why is it in a display case, one on its own? Well, weirdly, it became a celebrity. It, it, it became an odd kind of celebrity because when the animal appeared in the river back in 2006, people were just starting to get hold of uh, camera phones, not smartphones, camera phones. And I remember I, I said no to a camera phone. The museum offered me one and I said, well, that's crazy. You either have a phone or a camera, you don't have the two together. That's, that's never going to catch on. Of course it did, which is why I'm not a millionaire today. Um, but to be honest with you, the day that this thing appeared, I was down uh, on the Thames. I've been called by our press office. I was talking to some journalists who got some, some film footage of the animal swimming in the river. And she appeared in the river next to where I was. And, it, and basically the whole thing kicked off at that point. People were going to work. People were driving along the uh, embankment and they were stopping their cars coming to the embankment wall, taking photographs of the whale, sending it to their friends. Within the space of a couple of hours, we had thousands of people along the Thames and it became a mass uh, media event. And it was not just a UK event, it was a global event. It went, it went nuts. Um, what this did, what the, the specimen came to the, to the research collections at the Natural History Museum. 
And I'm glad it did for a lot of different reasons, primarily because it, it continues the time series that we have for this particular species that goes back to the um, early 19th century. We have examples that have been collected from strandings primarily through, through the decades. But it also gave us the opportunity to talk about the incredible um, marine biodiversity there is around the British Isles, um, particularly around, as we know, um, the, the northern parts of Britain, Britain around, around Scotland. And, and the school groups that were contacting the museum asking questions about this specimen was so surprised, particularly those schools that were not necessarily near the coast, so they didn't have that kind of coastal education and information about, um, about uh, marine biodiversity. We're surprised that, that, that animals like this lived in the waters around the British Isles. So it was a brilliant opportunity to, to help educate people. And the specimen has been on display a few times, a few times since then, but has kind of attained this celebrity status because there have been songs written about it and poetry, and somebody did its fortune and sent us the you know, the, the star chart and all kinds of things. Um, it's it's really quite remarkable how these things do develop. But we, we had a display case made for it. This was from a, a donor actually paid for a display case. So it could be displayed more often, but at heart, this is a, this is a research specimen. So the bones are not pinned and wired together. They're laid next to each other to give a sort of a, an impression of the overall um, uh, position in life, if you like, of the bones. That's absolutely key. I do occasionally, as I say, get to go to slightly more exotic places and, um, this was um, an opportunity that I had back in 2019 to go down to the Falkland Islands. Um, I had been contacted by my colleagues at um, uh, Falklands Conservation, um, particularly a, a, a researcher, a brilliant researcher down there called Caroline Weir. And um, she had let me know that there had been a stranding of this um, southern right whale dolphin. Um, we actually didn't have, or up until that point, didn't have any examples of this species in our collections. And she said, there's an opportunity for it to be, um, to be preserved and then passed on to you to go to the Natural History Museum. And I was lucky enough in um, 2019, actually not long after I'd spent my, my fabulous time on the Silurian um, uh, around the Hebrides, I was down in uh, the Falkland Islands and actually bumped into one of the crew from the Silurian. Can you believe in Port Stanley? I'm just walking along the street in Port Stanley and somebody shouts up my name and it's the chap from, uh, from the Silurian and uh, we couldn't believe it. Anyway, um, I um, was able to arrange for this specimen which had been kept in frozen storage to, to be popped onto a passing British Antarctic survey ship. Thanks British Antarctic survey who do such brilliant work um, and are such great people. And they brought it up to UK for me um, dropped it off at Tilbury and I was able to go and collect it and bring it to the NHM. An, an amazing opportunity to collect an incredibly, for us, rare specimen, not particularly rare in the wild necessarily, but not encountered that often. So that came into our research collection. Um, just before that, in 2017, um, Caroline Weir and Falklands Conservation had very kindly uh, put to one side for us uh, a spectacle porpoise. And I mean, they're beautiful animals. They're all beautiful animals. This had stranded at uh, San Carlos on the Falkland Islands. And again, was, was frozen and was brought up to, um, to the UK by British Antarctic Survey for us. A, a really rare opportunity to, to acquire something that we hadn't seen in our collections, hadn't had a, an example of brought into our research collection since 1922. And the last time um, in 1922, the, the last specimen that came in was from Ernest Shackleton and it was from South Georgia and as you know he died um, visiting South Georgia so it's an incredibly poignant specimen both in terms of I mean the the story surrounding Shackleton the historical significance of the specimen but scientifically so this again was a great acquisition for us now you saw the photograph I showed you earlier on of the the work we were doing on the Thames Whale and the way that we were taking the the body apart and we were sampling and recording as we went because these opportunities are so rare for us to um, to work on these specimens, we have to take we have to be so careful and collect as much information as we can for so many different people, um, and record everything as we go. And the next slide I'm going to show you, I, I still can't believe I was able to do this. Um, if I go back to the, the last one, this is the same specimen. This is actually a CT scan of the entire body of this spectacle porpoise done 
at the absolutely um, amazing Royal Orthopaedic Hospital NHS Trust in North London uh, on a training day. Now, they contacted the NHM long before and said, if any of your scientists have got specimens that you'd like to, to scan, we have days where we train our people at, um, at the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital. And it's useful for them to work on unusual things and things that are slightly different. And, and I contacted them and said, um, do you know what? I said, I've, I've got this, um, this frozen spectacle porpoise from the Falkland Islands. Is there any chance that I could bring it over for a CT scan or an MRI scan? And they said, absolutely, no problem at all. So we, uh, we jumped in a van, we took the specimen over there. They were absolutely brilliant. We, we wheeled it through um, the hospital and I felt a little bit guilty because there, I think, I don't know if there were people there waiting for a scan, but we certainly, we were, we were going through with this frozen porpoise, a, a porpoise popsicle on a trolley. And we got through into the labs and, and the, the results are just incredible. I mean, look at this. It shows you um, the, the skeleton in, in total. You can even see if you look beyond the rib cage, follow the spine towards the upper left-hand corner of the screen, you can see one of the pelvic bones, the vestigial pelvic bones in position. So the ability to see all of these bones in place before going anywhere near it with a scalpel, you know, to, to get this level of detail and data was remarkable. So this is the CT scan. And this is the one of the MRI scans. And it shows you quite clearly the blubber thickness um, now, one of the things that we noticed when we did the examination was that this, this female had uh, very um, depleted uh, blubber reserves. She, she was actually quite malnourished and there was nothing in the stomach at all. And this MRI scan actually shows that um, to, to a great degree. So an ability to use modern technology to record as much information about a specimen before you ever go near it with a, with a scalpel and do your traditional examination work. But it's about generating those data archiving those data, using them for your research and allowing people to, to use them for, for their research. It's about creating data sets and, and this, is, this is incredibly important. Using the data to help um, understand the lives of these animals and also the things that affect them and how we can then potentially plan and influence policy in the same way that HWDT does with, with their work, um, influence policy for the good and for the positive and for the conservation um, of these animals. Uh, another one that might not be particularly good for people who are a bit squeamish or um, having their dinner at the moment, but this is a this is a cyamid. This is a nectar parasite from the spectacle porpoise. And this was a CT scan that we did um, of one that we found attached to um, the underside of the animal. And of course, ectoparasites, parasites, parasites generally are, are, are fascinating, but they they're, they're important because particularly with the ectoparasites, it could be that you can only find these in a particular part of the. Um, the subantarctic region maybe this will give you an idea of, of where the animal is going on its migration route so we always um, collect everything that we we see on the animal and we then pass it on to the relevant experts within the natural history museum the scientists who understand these um, these organisms uh, i said that i'd talk to you about the um the earwax thing and um this is the earwax thing this was something that, that happened to me back in 2015 which i never thought would happen um, and it's quite bizarre, but I went to a, a conference, um, a marine mammal conference in San Francisco in 2015. And there were some marine biologists there talking about examinations they'd made on blue whales, which had become trapped in sea ice, unfortunately, and had died. Um, that, of course, gave the scientists an opportunity to do a very slow, uh, methodical, very careful, detailed uh, examination, dissection of the animals. And one of the things that I did was remove the earplugs. These are the ear canals, as, you, as you're all aware um, of uh, cetaceans, that there's no external opening. So particularly with baleen whales, uh, the, the wax that's secreted into those ear canals in the same way that we secrete wax into our ear, ear canals, with them, with cetaceans, large whales, it has nowhere to go. So these plugs form and they, they start to form pretty much from, you know, from the moment that the animal's born and they build up through the animal's life. And, they lay down in, in, in these very distinct uh, bands, these very distinct laminae, which you can actually excavate each of those. Um, each band correlates roughly to sort of one season feeding, breeding movement, roughly one year. And back in the 1950s, my, my predecessors at the Natural History Museum realized that these plugs could potentially, and in fact were used as one of the mechanisms to try and determine the ages of these uh, large whales, which have been virtually impossible up until that point. 
But the marine biologists in San Francisco in 2015 were saying that they found some interesting um, hormones and chemical contaminants in the, in the plugs from those blue whales, which had died um, the year before. And they said, wouldn't it be great if it was possible to use these plugs to look back in time? And of course, I started jumping up and down, waving my hands, and there were other museum people from the Smithsonian and other great collections in the world saying, we have these collections. We have these plugs in our collections going back a long time, many decades. And to cut a long story short, I ended up speaking with um, marine biologists and biogeochemists from uh, Bailey University in Texas. And we got together uh, with the Smithsonian, Natural History Museum and Bailey University. We used plugs from um, 20 different whales from both of our collections. Uh, and we were able to create a, a time series of overlapping sequences of earplugs that have been sectioned starting in um, 1870, going through to 2015. And what it allowed us to do was look at levels of stress hormones, particularly that was the focus of the study. It was a pilot to see if it could be done, but to see if there were any increases to the background levels of uh, stress hormone that you would find in tissues normally. And, and, and there were correlations with um, peaks of commercial whaling, correlations with um, wars in the ocean, you know, oceanic noise, um, correlations with the end of um, uh, commercial whaling. And, and unfortunately now, a massive amount of sublethal stresses that we know exist in the oceans, um, anthropogenic noise, uh, chemical pollution, plastics, we know uh, ghost fishing gear and all of these things which have effects on cetaceans. And, and of all of those, you know, I think it's the, it's the, the noise, the anthropogenic noise, pollution, the, the, the noise that we generate, it's so pervasive, as we know, um, sound travels so effectively through through water and, and these stresses, these are, these are causing increases in stress levels um, in cetaceans. And of course, we all know what it's like to feel stress for any period of time. It really affects your health and it can affect your health in serious ways. And these are cetaceans, these are animals which are under stress almost constantly in some cases. So it was a kind of a, you know, are these plugs of any value to science? Well, my goodness me, yes, they are. And uh, it was realized back in 2016-17. Uh, we published in Nature Communications back in 2018. And there's a link to the paper there. And I'd recommend anybody who's interested read it because there have been subsequent papers since then that have been looking at chemical pollution, um, you know, birthing intervals and all kinds of things, information from these plugs. So who knew? Who knew? They've been sitting in our collections at the Natural History Museum for decades as kind of items of interest, but with no real scientific utility until this happened um not that long ago and of course all of these great data that have been generated mean that you could put on cracking exhibitions too and, and this was one that i was asked to um to design and develop um and it opened back in 2018 2017-18 it's called whales beneath the surface we worked with wonderful designers and illustrators and colleagues from um the sea mammal research unit of course the great sea mammal Re research unit um, at st andrews um, and we created a, an exhibition that really informed, I think, in a beautiful way, our visitors about the evolution, particularly of cetaceans, and, and that's, that journey from the land back to the sea, which really surprised a lot of people, uh, looking at diversity, adaptations to life in the, um, in the oceans, uh, movement and migration. And, and it, was, it was important for us to try and generate a sense of connection between our visitors and the cetaceans. Um, you know, the degree of sophistication that we, we we know exists within cetacean societies particularly demonstrated in things like killer whales and sperm whales and you know the the, the learning and the transmission of knowledge and, and it's just a remarkable thing so all of that was put into the exhibition and it was very very successful i'm proud to say and it was a joy to work on um and uh, hopefully i'll work on another but i'd like to i realize i've come to the end of my many many slides and the last one I'm going to put up is actually um, it's a big shout out to HWDC and they haven't asked me to do this this I've done done this of my own volition there's no arm twisting going on um, I just think that I absolutely 100% behind the work that HWDT does um, the survey work they do from the Silurian the, the annual data collection it's so important for those data to be collected um, in that very methodical scientific uh, and professional way it's so, so important to the data sets that are created. And as the slide shows you, you know, it's not just about research, it's about education too, but it's also about informing policy. 
you know, governments don't do anything unless they've got good quality data in front of them. And the work of HWDT, along with the work of um, organisations like the NHM, that's, that's exactly what we do. And um, that's the end.